This is Gateway City Sports. You trying to say Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball? Smith corks one into right down the line. It may go. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. This is the Team of Rivals podcast. No insiders, no anonymous sources, just passionate analysis from the bleacher seats. Here are your hosts. Good evening, Cubs and Cardinals fans. It's Thursday, January 21st. Two weeks in a row, we've got a great guest showing up. Uh, Unfortunately, our permanent temporary kind of guest host Elliot wasn't able to join us um, but here with Ron and I today uh, the play-by-play voice of the St. Louis Cardinals um, for those Cardinals fans you already know who it is for Cubs fans shut up it's good to hear from the other side every once in a while so sit back and listen um, because this guy has 20 going on 24 years now of experience calling Cardinals games from the television booth uh, Fox Sports Midwest television play-by-play voice Dan McLaughlin. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. You got it. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Thanks. Doing good. A little warming up down here, I think. So, Dan, uh, just to give some background for our Cubs fans who aren't as familiar with you, um, you've called all the major sports at one point in your career, but you're almost exclusively identified with your Cardinals calls now. Uh, What is it about baseball that draws you um, there and has kind of pushed everything into the background for you? Um, you know, having grown up in St. Louis, I grew up in South St. Louis, uh, played baseball as a kid, loved the sport, um, always just had a, a, a fondness for the sport. Um, and I think when you grow up, whether it's in Chicago or you grow up in St. Louis and it's baseball crazed towns, uh, certainly in St. Louis, not to say it's not the case in, in Chicago, but you do have the other major professional sports, whether it be with the Hawks or the Blues um you know the bulls the bears that kind of thing uh for a while we had football here but it always just gravitated towards for me going back to baseball and and i played college baseball that's how i put myself through college i played it in high school had a a scholarship to go play baseball and um i owe everything to that stupid little ball uh in my life I'm, i'm very very fond of that ball it's given me my life and i'm very thankful that it's given me everything that I'm, I'm very appreciative for. And um, it's provided me with experiences and memories of a lifetime that I never thought I'd ever have the chance to, to have in my life. You know, meeting people that I never thought I'd meet, going to places that I never thought I'd, I'd go. Uh, as a kid, we never really traveled all that much um, for a, a vacation. You know, a vacation for us was going and borrowing a, a friend's van and going down to the Ozarks for a week. And now I'm, you know, could say I've been just about every place you could imagine in North America. I, I did the blues for a long time. I worked at ESPN, uh, did the NFL, did all those things. And it always brought me back to wanting to be the, the voice of um, the St. Louis Cardinals. I grew up a huge Cardinal fan and uh, Ozzy Smith was my favorite player growing up. And I say that I always practice doing what I'm doing today because we'd be, we would be in our backyard playing wiffle ball and I'd be announcing the games. And that started when I was literally four years old playing wiffle ball. I, I just, I love the sport. It's given me everything I, I enjoy this day. And um, I'm very, very thankful. Very, 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 very thankful. Whoa. So I get the sense that you're thankful. Yes, sir. Is the message. You, you bet I am. <laughs> and this is something, I mean, obviously, from the way you describe it, you had your eyes set on this for a long, long time. There was never any doubt that this was what you were going to do. Well, you realize you're not going to hit a 96-mile-an-hour fastball when you're in college. So you're reminded very quickly that um, this is probably the path you need to take. And then they start spinning off really good curveballs. 
and then you're really reminded that you better figure out your path very quickly that um, if you want to stay in sports and you enjoy baseball, you better figure it out very quickly that um, broadcasting is what you want to do. I, I never wanted – like Ozzy, like I said, was my favorite player growing up. I never wanted to be, though, the next Ozzy Smith. I, I wanted to be like the next Jack Buck, and by no means am I saying – I'm the next Jack Buck because I'm far from it. There'll never be another one like him, but he was the guy that I idolized growing up. And here in St. Louis, we're very blessed um, to have great announcers in, in my lifetime as a kid, whether it was Dan Kelly on the radio calling uh, blues hockey or, or Jack Buck calling Cardinals baseball. Um, obviously Bob Costas was, you know, cutting his teeth here and, and doing sports open line. Dan Deardorff was here doing stuff at KMOX. I mean, we had a lot of great people that, that got their careers started here and many of them stayed here. So I, I was by osmosis listening to those guys and kind of, I think when you listen to them, you kind of, you, you take bits and pieces of all those guys. And I always wanted to be a broadcaster. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And so um, that's kind of always what I wanted to do as a kid was just get involved in some way, somehow uh, doing something in broadcasting, something in this realm. And one thing led to another. And here I am. Dan, Dan speaking of uh, speaking of, uh, you know, icons and, and voices of St. Louis, uh, you know, after 62 seasons, nine as a player, Mike Shannon is going to retire after 2021. So just tell us a little bit about Mike and just your experience being around him. It's been great. Um, very lucky to be around Mike. You know, when I started, I was like 23, 24 years old. And there's countless stories. I mean, we could probably do a whole show on Mike. I mean, Mike is a character all in, all in itself. And Mike was great to me when I when I first started. And when you're that young, you know, he didn't have to be like that to me. But man, he included me in everything, the, the golf outings, the dinners, uh, taking me out, you know, at night afterwards and, and making sure I was a part of the crew and always included me. And now one of my favorite things to do before the games is that we go into the radio booth at, at Bush Stadium and, and hopefully we get back to that this year is we have dinner every night and Mike kind of holds court and listening to the stories and, and hearing about Hank Aaron and Willie Mays and hearing about the great Cardinals, um, you just – you don't find that every day and the first hand accounts and listening to those stories. Um, it's pretty amazing. But the thing that I'm very thankful of with Mike is that he included me from the time I got there and stepped foot um, being a broadcaster with the Cardinals. He didn't have to do that. You know, I could have been the new guy on the block and I was working with Mike and Jack at the time and we were doing three man boosts and that kind of thing on radio and I was doing some radio games with Mike and he made me feel as if I was an equal and he didn't have to do that. And I'll never, ever uh, be able to, to thank him enough for including me as being part of the family. And, and that really helped me in the beginning because when you're trying to follow Jack and Mike and Joe, and here's this new kid and you know, who is this guy? And to, to include me in that and to make me part of the family, that, that's a big deal. And it really helps you with the fans. So I'm, I'm very appreciative and always thankful that Mike did that. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about that story? How did you land such a plum gig at such a young age? I mean, basically <laughs> right out of college. And here you are calling games for one of the largest fan bases in the United States. Well, I, I went to Lindenwood University. I was playing baseball there, but I, I was always – um, I always say, you know, when kids were out partying and stuff on the weekends, I was out calling high school games, college games. Uh, I literally was sleeping in my car in various parts of uh, the state of Missouri to go call games. And then I'd sleep in my car and get up the next day and do the wrap up show um, to get experience. And we had a guy. So I was doing those kind of things all the time. I got a job at KMOX and I'm getting to the roundabout way of this. It may be a long story, but you asked the question. Um, at Lindenwood, we had a guy that taught a class um, down at KMOX. It was an editing class and that was on the old reel to reel machines and how to edit. And you literally would take a razor and you'd splice it up and tape it and stuff. And 
they pulled me out of the class and they said, you know, hey, we heard you're really in, involved in, in broadcasting and how would you like to have a job at KMOX? And I was probably, I don't know, 19 or 20 at the time. And you would be the guy that is running the Cardinal Baseball Network. And I thought, wow, what a, what a job. And really what that meant was is that you're pushing the button when it was like, you know, at the, the midway through the third and you, you press the button for the Anheuser-Busch commercial and that kind of thing. And after that game, you might answer the phones for, you know, Mr. Garden and Mr. Tinker and ask the lawyer and all this kind of stuff. And you're doing 12 hour shifts and that kind of stuff. And so I was doing that and that led into setting up remotes and things of that nature. But I always take my time down there and um, and try to use the equipment and have them listen to my tapes and things of that nature. Um, and I was setting up one time a remote for Joe Micheletti and Ken Wilson over at, at Enterprise Center, which was then Keel Center, before a Blues game. And there was a uh, some type of protest going on in front of City Hall. So I'd already set up the remote. I always carried a recorder with me, and I covered the – the actual protest of what was going on. I sent it down the line and it was a lead story on KMOX and I got some people's attention. They're like, man, who is this guy? You know, like what the hell's going on here? And so they, at that point in time, it was kind of a transition at KMOX and the company and they needed a guy to do some fill in on the weekends and read sports casts and things of like that, um, that ilk. And, and so, uh, I was 20 when I was on the air at KMOX. I was one of the youngest, if not the youngest ever at KMOX to be on the air. And so a friend of mine at that point then, uh, fast forward probably a couple of years, was at Fox Sports Midwest and said, hey, uh, they, they have this hockey show. You ought to be doing some features for it. And I said, uh, oh, okay. They said, you ought to meet with this guy. So I go in and meet with him. And he says, you're Dan McLaughlin? I said, yes, sir. And he said, you got to be kidding me. And at that point in time at KMOX, I had set up doing some intermissions for the blues. I developed some stuff on the air with KMOX. He said, I thought you were a 45-year-old man. And he wrote down on a piece of paper a, a guy that was a cameraman, a producer, and he threw, a, he threw the names and numbers at me. And he said, you got five features to, sh to show me what you can do. You got five. And he said, get the bleep out of my office. I said, okay. And I lied and said I knew what I was doing. Well, I knew Jack Buck at the time. I had done some Sunday night shows with him. And the first feature I did on Jack Buck was got nominated for an Emmy. It was a really neat piece. And one thing led to another. They said, hey, can you, can you intro these pieces on the air? Oh, sure I can. I'd never done that in my life. Uh, I lied about everything. And one thing led to another after that. Can you do intermissions? Sure, I could do that. Started doing that. And then they said, well... We're going to start doing these pregame shows. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. And then they said, well, we're not going to travel a pregame show guy, and we, we need you to do play-by-play. -play. And I actually, the first time they offered it to me, I turned it down. Um, I said, I'm, I'm not ready to, to do play-by-play. -play. And they said, well, you're going to be ready. And, I, you know, all honesty, I, I wasn't ready for it. And, and, I, and I look back on it now, I wasn't ready for it. It was an overwhelming job, but – I, here, you know, I, I took it obviously. And, and, uh, they said, you're going to take it. And I did it. And there was growing pains along the way. And I grew into the job and, and that's the long and short of it, but here I am. Well, of course they told you, you were going to do it. You kept saying yes to everything else, even though they had any experience. <laughs> well, they, you know, they, I think they thought, you know, I had some talent and, um, I had done some high school stuff for them and, that's not Cardinal baseball, but you know, it's, it's a, obviously a different animal, but they, they grew with me and, and the fan base grew with me and, and it's been great ever since. It's been awesome. Hey Dan, a couple of years ago when I had talked to you, it was on a different uh, podcast. You were just starting up scoops with Danny Mack. And in fact, you called it a little side venture at the time. It's gotten a lot bigger than that. And you've been able to continue to grow that over even through a pandemic when we had less sports and than we normally would. And now I look up and I see the Chris Raby show and Bernie Miklas. Did you expect it to move along? Was this always the plan that it would arrive at least at this point in this form this quickly? Um, I, I thought it would grow. I didn't know it would get to this point. You know, like we, we started now a TV show on Channel 2 on Sunday nights as well. Um, I knew it had legs. Uh, the whole idea was, is that I thought there'd be a, a contentious CBA next year in baseball. And I, I wanted to have something to fall back on. And, um, and so I never in my wildest imagination thought we'd have 
horribly as this, this pandemic. And now here we are. And during the pandemic, you know, we were able to keep things going. Uh, we have great people that, that are just unbelievable that, that do remarkable work behind the scenes. Lauren Vierhoff is, is one, Brian McCann is another. I mean, they're just incredibly talented people that really are the, the, uh, the brains behind the operation. I'm just the knucklehead that kind of runs it too. And they're the ones that, that keep this thing going. And what I found was that during the pandemic, people were just yearning for sports. Like they wanted an outlet to hear something, like something outside of COVID-19. Like, just tell me something that's going on in sports, especially during the quarantine. Like they, just give me something. Like, are we, are we gonna have sports? Are we gonna, you know, what are players doing? What, what are what are front offices doing? And so I kind of looked at that as an avenue to, to get into an audience that we weren't, getting to before that where it was just turnkey before, like everybody just knew it was sports was sports, sports, everything was sports. Every, it was always there. And when it wasn't there, everybody really missed it. And so open it up to a different audience and we were able to get that audience and keep them. And it just, it really has exploded. So that part of it has been great. I think when you look at where we are at in media, um, like God, from where I started, you know, 30 years ago, it's, it's just completely changed. I mean, look at what you guys are doing, what we're doing here on a zoom. Um, I always say that when I go speak to classes now, like colleges ask me to go speak to them all the time. I mean, this is this phone for people that are listening. I'm holding a phone. I mean, every one of these kids um, are a reporter, you know, I mean, your, your phone is, you're a reporter everywhere you go. I mean, you can take a picture, you can record something, you can do something. So everything's at our fingertips to have instantaneous reaction. So by being able to have a website and put it out on social media, that's kind of where I thought this thing was going. And I think it's going to be bigger and better as we continue to move along. And as we start to open this thing up and the vaccine gets out there to where people are always wanting information. And that's what I try to do. Like I, I, I always go back to Wall Street where there's that great line in the in the, the movie where he says, get me information, pal. And that's what I always think. People want info and that's what I try to provide. So how was uh, the 2020 season different calling that from the broadcast booth? I mean, at least in your experience. It was do well. The road games are like doing it like this. Uh, I had a monitor about as big as this computer and I'm trying to call games off the, the monitor. It was hard. I mean, I was talking to somebody today and, and you get done with those games and you're, you're really exhausted. Like you're physically tired. Um, and not to say that we're out there doing manual labor. I mean, that that's hard stuff, but I mean, you, you are really trying to do a great job. Not that I, I don't try to do a really good job for people. I always do take great pride in trying to give you what I got, but especially this year when people wanted an outlet for three, three and a half hours to get away from COVID or to get away from what was happening in society, you know, for three, three and a half hours, a ball game might do that. And so I, I tried to really amp it up and be as positive as we could and say, Hey, here's a, here's a game. Here's a presentation that maybe will take your mind off that stuff for three, three and a half hours for people that felt like they were locked in their homes. And my mother is a great example. Um, she has pre-existing conditions and she does not leave her house. And one thing she loves is Cardinal baseball. And I felt like for three, three and a half hours, it was my duty to try to help people like her and others, countless thousands, millions of people that watch to give them an outlet to enjoy themselves. Cause there wasn't a lot of enjoyment this summer of many things you can do. And maybe a baseball game was something they enjoyed. So that was something different. And, you know, technically to answer your question, when we were on the road, when the team was on the road, we, we weren't with them. So we're trying to do the games off a monitor as best we could. And I know we miss things. I know there are times I thought a pop-up was like, and for your Chicago Cub fans, maybe a pop-up turned into a home run and a home run turned into a pop-up. Sorry, I tried my best. But, you know, I would laugh at myself. You know, I just said, hey, we're trying our best, but, you know, we're doing the best we could. Sometimes we didn't know who was on deck. Sometimes we didn't know who was warming up. Sometimes it was tough to tell who was in a shift, who wasn't, because we did have certain monitors that could show us what was going on, but you can't always see pitch to pitch to pitch. You know, I can't look over here and then see what's going on here and then over here. I, it just, it just, it was, it was just impossible to do that, but we did the best we could. And I thought we did a pretty good job with it. No, I think you did, uh, Dan. There's one thing that, you know, going into the season, I kind of, I talked to Brad Thompson in July and so he kind of went through what you guys were going to go through on the road games. And, 
uh, you know, when they talked about pumping the, the crowd noise in during the broadcast and everything, I didn't know how I felt about that. Like, That's going to be kind of odd, but I thought we had to have it. Yeah, no. And I agree. And, and I think after the first game, you know, when the camera wasn't showing the stands in the background, you didn't know the difference between uh, a regular game where it was a packed house or whether it was an empty stadium. So it really felt uh, pretty natural to me. And it's been in the radio broadcast. You wouldn't have noticed the difference either. So I thought it was, I thought you guys, all of you did a great job. Yeah, our director did a great job. Our producer did a great job, too. I, I think they, they well, I, I don't think I know. I mean, they, they tried to purposely shoot the game, meaning the camera angles tighter if they could so that you wouldn't see as many empty seats. Um, over the weekend, our winter warm up, I talked to Matt Carpenter about this. I said one of the weird things was like he had a grand slam. Sorry to rub this in, but he had a grand slam at Wrigley. And one of the really weird parts of this year, he hits a grand slam, it hits the bleachers at Wrigley, and we had the parabolic mics at Wrigley, and I could hear the ball rattle <laughs> in, the, in the, the, the bleachers. And I was like, gosh, that was weird. It just was weird, you know? And, and, and I know the Cubs are, it was kind of fun how their team was so vocal. It was like taking you back to a Little League game, and they're, you know, chanting at the other team, and the other team's chanting at them, and you could hear sometimes – some of the things that you didn't want to hear, which I know is part of why they across the board in Major League Baseball wanted to pipe in the, the crowd is because, you know, you, you're going to hear some things that probably Major League Baseball did not want to be broadcast on their games. I mean, you're going to hear some coarse language. You're going to hear things that are discussions between players or umpires that maybe you don't want to hear because it's, a family game, quote unquote, you know, you're, you're going to hear some of those things. Um, but that was kind of the beauty of it too. And I, I like that. I, I think we learned some things too throughout these games that maybe we, we should incorporate going forward. Um, that was good for baseball too. So maybe we'll see that going ahead with 2021 when we do get some fans in the stands. Cause I do think we're going to have them. What are you hearing about the 21 season? Are you guys going to travel with the team or will you continue to broadcast remotely? I, I wish I knew we, we don't know. Um, and I, I would like to know sooner than later so my wife would actually get off my ass about when I'm going to leave uh, the house because she wants me out of the house. And you guys think I'm kidding. They want me out. I got four kids and a wife. They want me gone. Um, it was beautiful to be home in the beginning of quarantine because it's the first time I've not been on a plane since I got home from spring training of last year. And that's the longest I have not been on a plane in probably the last 25, 30 years. And that part for me has been awesome. I love it. But um, to the point of trying to do my job, it's really hindered it. Because when you think of um, what we try to do over the course of when you're a hometown broadcaster, especially in TV, when you're trying to, because we give you the runners, we give you the outs, we're showing you where guys are positioned. A lot of our job is to fill in the gaps and there's not a lot of action right now in baseball in 2021. So we're trying to tell you the stories of the players. We're trying to tell you what's happening. So that is our time going down on the field, talking to the manager. Here's some of the storylines. Hey, Matt Carpenter's working on this. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt is doing this. Hey, here's what's going on. Here's some history. It, you know, And if we don't have access, it's really hard over the course of six to seven months not to have access to do that. Now, you can get some of that stuff on Zoom, but that's not the behind the scenes stuff that we need to have if we're not there every single day. So we did the best we could and we'll do the best we can if that's what we're forced to do. But um, to answer your question, we just don't know. I, I guess the virus will dictate it and hopefully within two to three months, you know, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of that, but we'll, we'll make do with what we can do. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the big things. I don't know what's worse, Danny Mac not knowing whether he's going to travel with the team or or not, National League not knowing whether they have a DH or not. Um, but there's another thing we don't know. I mean, the game itself has a lot of questions in it. But what did you think about the DH last year, uh, Dan? That was the first time it arrived in the National League, and I, I think Pete and I agree that it was. We thought next time around, this this next CBA, it was going to be here to stay anyway. Um, but you're seeing it for the first time in, in the ballpark last year. How was it, in your opinion? I'm a traditionalist. I, I would rather not see the DH, but after I saw it in play, uh, I liked it more and more. And I do think it's here to stay. I think it's ridiculous that it hasn't been decided yet. I think it's ridiculous that here we are in late January and it hasn't been decided by major league baseball. I, 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 I don't quite understand that. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, 
I understand that everything has to be negotiated, but it's really at a hindrance for the clubs and for the players. I mean, you've got certain guys that you would peg and say, Nelson Cruz is solely a DH and you're limiting him technically to 15 teams. That, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I would think going forward, we will have the DH. I think majority of fans, especially our younger fans, it seems like they want it. So if that's what they want, we might as well have it. Um, I would just imagine this dovetails into some other things that you might ask me about. I, I think the seven inning double headers was good. It was out of necessity because you were trying to protect your, your players. But I, I also saw a sense of urgency in the game. I, I, I thought it was good that when you were in the third inning, you were engaged. And I thought that was good for, for fans. Um, I'm hearing more and more that people really liked starting a runner at second base in extra innings. I'm, I'm okay with it. And if this is what people want, then we should give it to them. If this is what fans wanted to see, then I'm all for it. Again, I'm a traditionalist predominantly, but if this is what fans want to see, then by all means, I'm all for it. Speaking of the DH, um, what are your thoughts on the idea, and I know it's been largely promoted by Jason Stark, of tying the DH to the uh, starting pitcher, that as long as your starting pitcher's in the game, you get to keep your DH, but once you pull him, you're back to essentially a National League style of play. I, I think it's interesting. I, I do like seeing some type of, because I, I wasn't a big proponent of the three batter minimum. I, I didn't, didn't, you know, the idea was let's speed up the game and the games were taking three hours and five or six minutes anyway. So I'm not sure that that really helped. And it, it took out um, some of the strategy in the game. I think this might bring in some strategy back into the game. And I do think it makes you think about when you want to pull that starter. And so I'd, I'd be for it. I, I think it's something to at least tinker with. Um, so I, I kind of like the idea. I think it's kind of fun. Um, and I do, would, I, I do think it would make you think twice about pulling that starter, especially if that DH is coming up in your lineup. I, I, I kind of like it. I, I think it'd be kind of fun to do it. Well, it would definitely set the National League and American League apart, right? Rather than make, I mean, they share umpires. For sure. There's not a lot that differentiates them anymore if you bring the DH fully over. My only thought of risk would be um, our, you know, our managers uh, prone to maybe keep starters in longer than what they really think they need to, and you burn people out long term uh, doing that. Maybe not, uh, but it's just a just a thought that it occurred to me. I, I kind of I kind of like the idea. It's interesting, but. Um, you know, I just want to know one way or the other. Uh, I'm not the most patient guy in the world, so. Well, I, I think the, th the thing that we had to be careful with, too, is coming off the, the truncated season is how far are these pitchers going to go anyway? Um, I, I think it's going to be really interesting, uh, and it's going to be, I think, a case-by-case -case look at all the organizations and how they approach their starters, and, and in, in particular, their young pitchers how deep and how long will they let them go initially in the early portions of seasons and maybe throughout the entire season. And will some even major league teams piggyback the rotations um, is going to dictate as we saw in the world series that some guys only go as far as they go anyway. But when you only had certain starters going, whatever it was, 40, 50, 60 innings, last year you got to be really careful like are you going to have certain starters going 200 innings this year i don't think so i, I think they're going to be really careful about how deep they go with their starters to protect them for their careers and for making sure that they're protected from injury so if you're incorporating a rule that if you take them out and all of a sudden then you're going to your bullpen earlier i i, I think that's something you got to keep in mind going forward in 2021 so speaking of 2021 um we've seen a lot of names move out of the NL central, um, this off season, not a lot coming in. <laughs> right. The yard uh, sale, Dan. <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think this says about the NL central? I mean, it, it, it certainly seems like the Cardinals are, are benefiting at least to this point in the off season, simply by standing pat and watching everybody else take themselves down. Um, are you expecting more movement as the market shakes it out? Or do you think that this is, this is what the NL central is going to be and it's going to be, you know, baseball's version of, of football's NLE or uh, uh, yeah, NFC East this year where we get a team that's below 500 that makes the playoffs. I, I think the central is wide open. Um, I don't think Pittsburgh is going to win by the way. Yep. Um, but I do think it's wide open uh, currently constructed just because not many teams are going for it. Uh, and that includes the Cubs with what they've done with Darvish and Quintana and Lester I think the Cardinals by standing pat, you know, I, I would look at them as making a move or two and that would put them ahead of some others. 
but it, it's wide open and it, it could be a move or two by a few of these teams. And namely, I would look at Chicago, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and that would put them ahead of others and maybe even Cincinnati, but I don't like what they did with the back end of their bullpen. Um, the one thing I would look at from a St. Louis perspective where they may be ahead of others is to the point I made earlier, they are very deep in their pitching. And that even includes minus Adam Wainwright. Um, looking at what they have, they've got, by my count, and this includes like a Libertor or a Thompson, um, they, they could go 20, 21, maybe 22 deep of guys that potentially could see big league time this year and be effective. And when you have that many pitchers that could get time, whether it be in the rotation, middle relief, back end of their bullpen, um, and if you don't have starters going deep, I would think that that benefits them maybe more so than some of these other teams. Because if you don't have starters going deep and you have effective middle relief to get you to the back end of your bullpen, and the Cardinals do have a good bullpen, I think that puts them ahead of some of the other teams, even with a deficient offense. And their offense, the Cardinals – Offense was not good last year. It has to be better this year, but they may be playing a lot of tight games. And if they get some type of offense, I think that could put them ahead of some other teams. So it may not be pretty, but their, their pitching may put them ahead of some of the other teams as currently constructed. Having said that, now that we do get an idea that spring training supposedly is going to start on time, 17th or 18th, whenever camps open up, um, I do think we're going to see, generally speaking, in baseball, some more movement because teams now are saying, OK, we have a start date. We got to fill some of these holes. And I think we're going to see more teams make some more movement. You mentioned a mover, too. Uh, I'm sure that the thing that's uh, standing at the head of the line for a number of Cardinals fans and, and even for Cubs fans, because he's such a pain in the ass for us. Um, do you think that one of those moves is Yachty coming back? I, mean, I do. Yeah, I think Yachty. Yeah, I think more and more, I think the signs point to him coming back. And that, that's not from anybody telling me or insider information. That's just kind of reading the marketplace and where it goes. Um, I think we'll know more once Real well, Muto does officially sign. And I think that's how mostly it works in free agency. I mean, you saw McCann sign for his plot. You know, he got his money. And that was one of the teams you could look at and say, okay, that would have made sense there. But when Ramuto, who's kind of the big fish at that position, signs, other teams are looking at maybe signing him and they say, okay, that was that was plan A and now here's plan B, C, D. And Yachty may be on those lists. Um, but I, I think when you look at legacy and what he means to this franchise, a lot of signs point to him coming back. Uh, I'd be very disappointed if he doesn't come back because I want to see him retire a Cardinal. I think when you look at over the last handful of years, uh, decades, it's been really impressive to see. Um, over the years, the Cardinals have had a Hall of Famer basically in their lineup just about every year. It's been really neat to see. And for me to call the game, selfishly speaking, it's been pretty cool to see. Um, and I do think Yachty is a bona fide Hall of Famer. And, and people can argue with me on that. That's fine. I know there's probably some that haven't watched him every day of his career like I have. I watch the intangibles. He's a Hall of Famer. And I think when he got 2,000 hits, that, that was the final nail in the good coffin to put him into the Hall of Fame. I think that puts him in. Um, but I do think a lot of the – when you're starting, starting to put the, the boxes of why he comes back, those boxes point to him coming back. And I do think he'll wind up in St. Louis. If he doesn't come back, do you think Kisner's ready to take on number one catcher duties? It's an interesting question because it would have made a lot of sense in a truncated season when Andrew Kisner uh, would have been the guy to be the backup last year with all the double headers wasn't here. And you had Matt Wieters that was kind of hobbling around um, and was ineffective many times offensively getting the bulk of the playing time. So it does make me wonder a little bit but there's a lot of people that are very high in the organization with him. Um, how many starts does that mean that he would get? We would find out. But, yeah, I think that would be the direction that they go. But there are guys that are out there that they could turn to, too. Hey, Dan, I want to shift gears real quick here. My son, I have a 15-year-old. Uh, he's, a, he's, he's a huge fan of yours. He's a big baseball fan. He loves it just as much as I did when I was young and growing up. But he's 15. Um, I told him he could not leave any of his school Zoom calls today to ask you a question. So we recorded one uh, pre-show. And so I'm going to play that one now. Uh, of course, and I asked him to please ask you one question. And I think- What's he, his name? 
Braden. Uh, okay. I think he packed about five questions in here. So I'll just go <laughs> ahead and play it. And uh, here it is. Hey, Dan. Uh, big fan and someone who uh, wants to be a Cardinals broadcaster someday, hopefully alongside you, calling a Cardinals game. And I just wanted to say, um, what is your favorite um, Cardinals moment on and off the field? Uh, what is your favorite thing about being a Cardinals broadcaster? And uh, what would be your number one advice for someone like me who wants to be in your position one day? And thank you for what you do for the Cardinals on the air and being one of my uh, favorite guys to listen to. Awesome. Remind me of some of the questions if I miss them. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? He's uh, sure. And uh, he's actually on the line now. And uh, so I'll, I'll let him listen to your response. Hey, Braden. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, well, first of all, I, I think my first answer would be you, you got to have a passion for anything that you do in, in life. Um, I have a passion for this. So whether you want to, uh, be a broadcaster, be a player, uh, be a banker, be a lawyer, um, whatever you want to do. It, it, when you realize that you get through school, whatever that may be, it's, um, it's what you're going to do the rest of your life. And so you got to have a passion. You got to have a love for it. So whatever you do, you got you to gotta dive fully into it and have a passion and go for it. Don't let anybody say you can't do it. I had people telling me that there was no way that you will be the Cardinals announcer. One of those was my dad, who, God rest his soul, was uh, he's been gone for over two decades, but he told me there is no chance you should be doing this. And I said, I'm going to show you. And I did. And he was one of many in a long line that told me I wouldn't be able to do this. And I showed him. So I was motivated to show a lot of people that I could do this. So don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because you can. There's nobody that can tell you that you can't do something because you can. Um, my favorite moment behind the mic was, uh, I've told this story many times and I'll make it quick, but was the Matt Holiday home run um, in his final weekend in St. Louis. We thought it was going to be his final at bat as a Cardinal and he hit a home run. And we weren't sure that uh, he was going to get into the games that weekend. The Cardinals were mathematically alive and they were just trying to figure out a time he was hurt of getting to the plate and he comes up and he hits a home run and he looked terrible in the at bat basically prior to the swing that put him that, that gave him the home run and he had tears coming down his his cheeks and the reason I love it is because I knew a lot of what he meant to the organization and I had been privy to information that he was not going to be re-signed as a cardinal or brought back and so I knew it was probably his final at bat unbeknownst to me he would get an at bat the next day and get a base hit so he ruined the moment, uh, moment with a base hit the next day so Shame on Matt to get a base hit the next day. But we thought it was his final at bat. It was an incredible moment. He had done so many great things in our community with sick kids and started Homers for Health, which was through Cardinal Glennon, raised millions of dollars, which still goes on today. But he, he had gone a lot of times after games to visit sick kids and wanted no fanfare for it. Um, and I appreciated that. You know, you hear about the bad things that – sometimes happen with professional athletes. He was everything that was right about a pro athlete. And I loved him for that. And I love him to this day for everything he means to uh, the franchise. Um, what was another question too? There was three of them and I can't remember the other one. Braden, do you recall? I'll let you ask him directly. Did he answer everything? Um, you got him on the spot here. I'm going to give you limited time because I hope you're not missing school. <laughs> well, no. I, this is ap this is about five minutes after Spanish class, actually. Okay. So I'm in I'm in a classroom, but I was able to get on. Um, so I'm good. I got permission from the teacher. But um, another question was, uh, what was your uh, favorite thing to do off the field uh, for the Cardinals, or just in life, and some things that you look forward to and have have done in your career? Well, I would tell you one of the things that I wish. I knew better that you're actually doing right now. I wish I knew Spanish better. Um, as many of the players that um, are coming from uh, the Dominican or Puerto Rico or Mexico, 
I wish I was able to communicate better in their language. And that's on me. I, um, so you're coming from Spanish class, as you just said, I would learn Spanish a lot better. So if you want to be a broadcaster and you want to communicate with those guys better, I would learn Spanish better. That, that is something I, I really wish I, I, I can pick up little things. I'm not great with it, but I wish I, I knew Spanish better. Um, the other thing in being a broadcaster is in, especially with um, even in sports, the things that I read, I, I read a ton. I'm a voracious reader in books and things. I read things that are totally non-sports. Mostly, mostly what I read is non-sports. If I have free time, it's uh, totally non-sports, a lot of uh, non-fiction, and it's a lot of non-sports. If I can read about things that have nothing to do with sports, those are the things that I, I like to do. I try to do a lot in the community um, because I think this job, especially when you're in markets like, and this isn't to say that there are lesser markets, so I hope people get that, uh, under, understand that. But when you're involved in a, a community like St. Louis, and Jack Buck was incredible at this, and I learned watching him, you have to be involved in the community. You have to be involved. The, the role of, of, of what I do is, is way more than calling balls and strikes. It should be involved in trying to make this a better place. And by no means am I saying I'm Mother Teresa because I'm far from it. I'm just trying to say that I do try to get involved in the community because it's important. Um, these people that are here that support the team are, are the people that I grew up with and the people that I talk to every night in a baseball game. And they're the people that um, support me too. And so if you can get involved in your community in some way, somehow, I, I think that's very, very important really important love the kid to death but dan he thinks he has a segment on our show he busts in here every week it's good he, he, so he's uh he's doing this at, a, at an early age so I'm, a part of me's proud of him the other part of me gets a little irritated so i've got him on mute that's fine i'm glad he i'm glad he got to talk to you directly i know that means a lot to him um you know speaking of what you've done in the community dan i've also seen you really get behind mls uh, the soccer team that's that's coming to St. Louis, which I'm excited for. Because I'm excited for, while not be the may not be the biggest soccer fan, I'm excited for the city. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. Um, you know, when we lost the Rams, th that was a kick in the gut. I, I grew up a huge football Cardinal fan, and then obviously became a huge Rams fan. And it's one thing to lose the team; it, it's another thing to lose the team in the manner that uh, the city lost. Uh, the Rams and um, and I, I've told the story before and I, I went in front of the board of aldermen and you know made the speech and then did a you know try to do my my part uh, behind the scenes and, and what I could and the, the people that are, are behind the MLS movement the ownership group and whatnot are, are good people and they're doing it for the right reasons and um, I just felt you know in, in my small part in trying to raise awareness as to why they're doing this this was way, way more than, than soccer. Now, my kids play soccer, and I, I've said this many times. I'm not the biggest soccer fan. I enjoy the sport, but I know what it could mean to our community, and, and that's why I got behind it. Um, the, the story I've told is that my son, um, at the time, I had never really seen him cry, and he cried the night the, the, the Rams left. And I'm trying, sitting there trying to explain to him, you know, why they're leaving, and I couldn't come up with a reasonable response except for greed and money and, and that's hard to do I mean that's that's tough you know no, this is big boy stuff I get it it's business but you, you try to explain that to a little kid and quite frankly it pissed me off and so I just tried to do what, what me as a parent and in my role and having what I could do you know to, to do a little part of whatever kind of pull I might have to raise some awareness for these people and what they're trying to do. And hopefully it made a difference. And obviously it made a little bit of a difference and we're going to have soccer here. And I think it's going to be great because people will get behind this. I mean, this is a great, great sports town and the narrative needed to change. Um, you know, I think that the narrative outside of St. Louis was that, well, they, they didn't support it and they, they, the, you know that th these people didn't didn't care and that, that couldn't have been further from the truth and I, I think that needed to get out there well, I think that was a little bit disproved when the battle hawks arrived and and sure they had some tremendous support but I'll go go ahead Pete Dan you know you mentioned being involved in in the community and 
one of the big things that you're known for is your uh, golf tournament. You're, it's going on what eight years now? Is that right? No, eighteen. Oh, eighteen. Oh my God. Yeah. Even, even more. Um, is it going to happen this year? And uh, and and what is it about uh, the Special Education Foundation that drew you in to select that as your beneficiary? So we have raised close to five million dollars. One hundred percent goes to kids with special needs. Um, had a friend of mine that uh, at one point we were talking and he has a daughter that has uh, severe needs. And basically it's the, the group that I'm with, a special education, education foundation. When the tax dollars stop, we step in. And so a lot of these parents hit a certain threshold with money that they make or whatever, and they can't help their kids. And so it's really tough on them. I mean, it's very expensive when you have, kids that that have special needs and it runs the gamut i mean it, it could be all kinds of things of uh, something as simple of and i say simple but I, I i hope people take that the right way of your kid grows up and as they continue to grow they need a hearing aid or they grow out of a wheelchair or they need a a certain whiteboard or uh, whatever the case may be um a special uh need with a teacher uh, we've, we've done classrooms, things of that nature, and it's it's very expensive. And if you hit a certain threshold, they, they can't afford it. And so we come in and you make the case for us and we'll write you the check and we'll make sure we get what those services that need to be done. Um, and so my friend just kind of came to me and was just blurted out everything that happened. And I said, man, that that that's not right. We need to change that. And so that's how that, that all started. And started a golf tournament, um, did it on my own at first. And um, it was tough at first trying to start that thing by yourself. And then, you know, thank goodness, uh, came, came in contact with the right people, right board members that just fully got 100% behind it. And now it just kind of runs itself, which is awesome. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of work, but those people, man, they're, they're the ones that do it. I mean, I, my name's on it. Don't get me wrong. I'm involved and I'm helping out and getting sponsors and and I'm making sure I get people to getting out there and playing and donating money and getting auction items and all that kind of stuff. We sell it out every year, but um, it's, it's been, it's, it's so gratifying to see the, the people that we help. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, to have scholarships awarded for kids because some, some of these kids are, are on the full spectrum of, of, you know, having really special needs. And there's other kids that are, they just need a little push or need a little help and we get them through college, that kind of thing. Um, so to see all those kind of kids that we can help and make a difference, it's, it's really cool. Dan, last thing I've got for you. Now, this is, uh, uh, I talked to another gentleman who you're very familiar with a few years ago. He goes by the cat. Um, he's, he's the best. He, was, he is the best. He's the best cable sideline reporter. He'll tell you that. He'll be the first to tell you that. Um, regional cable. Regional cable. Um, he was boasting on one of the shows I have how he's a huggable guy. So it, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but uh, I'm a huggable guy. I mean, look, <laughs> I'm huggable. So, I mean, I've asked Matt Holiday to vet this out. I've asked Brad to vet it out. So you'll be the third. I'm trying to, tr I'm trying to triangulate this thing, see if this claim is even true or not. So just get your opinion. Is he, is he a huggable guy? Oh, yeah. Very huggable, squeezable, spoonable. All of them. Oh, I've never spooned them, but I've just been told. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. Very huggable. So true. Very lovable. He's the that. cat. I'll stop giving him a hard time. Okay. Yeah. He's the best. Hey, well, Dan, Dan uh, obviously we've moved into kind of the lighter section of, uh, of the interview. I didn't notice. <laughs> we won't get into whether or not Ron's huggable. Um, but uh, obviously we've scratched the surface. So, uh, you know, preemptively, I hope that uh, you'll come back on here sometime because this has been fun and we'll do it again. Uh, just my last question for you. Um, what's your favorite memory, given the thrust of our podcast, what's your favorite memory of the uh, Cubs Cardinals rivalry? Oh man, there's been a bunch. Um, I would say probably generally speaking, just being at Wrigley is great. Uh, I love going to Wrigley field I, on a, on a weekend of a beautiful and I think I, I think this now more than ever because we weren't able to do it. But being at a packed Wrigley on a beautiful like June day is pretty awesome. Um, so that's generally speaking. Um, I think my favorite moment was the the pools three home run day. That was pretty good. Uh, Peralta down to his final strike was a pretty good one. Um, 
there's been so many. I, I think of like Albert getting knocked down and then hitting one on the street. Um, those are fun. There's just so many. I, I, I Wrigley is a special place. Um, there's been Pujols' 2,000th hit at Bush Stadium against the Cubs. Not many people talk about that, but I, I just find it ironic that he gets his 2,000th hit against Chicago, um, you know, at Bush Stadium. Um, there's been great moments, man. I mean, it, and it's just always fun. I mean, it's just – it's just always crazy. And the fans have a great respect for each other. That's the one thing that I find is that, yeah, they're going back and forth and you see the cubby blue and you see the Cardinal red, but there's always a great respect, generally speaking, of you don't see the fights in the stands. At least I don't, I haven't, but I, I just see people having fun. You know, I, I miss that about the game. I, I miss seeing the people together and that's, what I can't wait to see coming up in 2021. And hopefully we get back to that sooner than later. Yep. That's uh, definitely our hope. Um, just on a personal note, uh, on a personal level, Ron and I have had numerous side bets um, over the years and uh, Ron's always paid out. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that <laughs> opportunity again. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm really bad at those, Pete. I picked the wrong games, the wrong times. I had to wear a Cubs Jersey into Bush stadium before I've had to wear a Cubs Jersey in Wrigley field. And of course, when I took it off after the seventh inning, when he let me, I had a Cardinals uh, shirt on under it. So I fooled a lot of people out there. They weren't very happy with me. Um, Ron, I think that this is definitely going to be the year for you to do it because uh, I think that the odds are in your favor and finally winning a bet. I hope and so. Making me pay. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, you got anything else for Dan? I, I don't. I don't. I want to be respectful of Dan's time. And, uh, and Dan, thank you again. It was great to talk to you again. Thank you so much for uh, uh, answering uh, my son's question. He's still hanging out. I can see him over there on the phone. Um, you got it. But, uh, thank you so much for answering his question and just spending some time with us. Great to talk to you, uh, the TV voice of the Cardinals, and we hope we can do this again sometime. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Hey, Dan, before, uh, before you jump off, uh, where can people find you if they're looking for you on the Internet? Uh, at Danny Mac TV. All right. At Danny Mac on, TV. Yep. That's on Twitter? Yep, that's on Twitter. Best place to find me. Terrific. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. That's our interview with Danny Mac. Hope you guys enjoyed it, Cubs fans. I hope you learned a little something, uh, and and I know that I speak for Ron and probably Elliot too, if he was uh, if he was here to express it. Um, certainly, I hope that Dan comes back uh, at some point in the future because we had a whole list of questions that we didn't even get close to asking. So, uh, hopefully, that'll be something we can do again in the near future uh, when his schedule allows it. And as always, remember when we're not live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope, you can find the team arrivals anywhere and everywhere. Our website is teamarrivalspodcast.com. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Team Arrivals Podcast or on Twitter at Team Arrivals Pod. Send us an email at the show at teamarrivalspodcast.com. Even though he's not here today, you can find Elliot on Twitter at TOR underscore Elliot. You can find Ron at TOR underscore Ron 75. And don't forget, he's number 48. You can also check out our producer, Gino, at Crash STL on Twitter. If you are watching us live, please like and subscribe, uh, whether it's Facebook or YouTube. Um, just go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button, and they'll let you know the next time that we've got a show coming up. You can also catch us anywhere you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Stitcher, and so forth. So whether you watch us live or listen to the audio podcast, be sure to like and subscribe and leave us a comment or a review. You can easily review the show by going to ratethispodcast.com slash TOR and follow the simple instructions. As always, don't forget to make your review a good one. And don't forget to check out the rest of the Gateway City Sports Network, including the Derek King Sports Show every Wednesday at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live and 2 for 3 with Moose Michaels. You can find all that and more at gatewaycitysports.com. Ron, anything else you want to add before we, uh, we call it a week? Um, not a whole lot other than we don't know, you, you know, we look forward to at some point in time to getting back onto our live Thursday shows, but we've had a, obviously a couple of big names on over this last couple of weeks. And so uh, we're not much good to you for more than an hour. So we figure if we spend an hour behind this microphone each week, that's probably the best you're going to get of us. And anything we give you on top of that is just going to be garbage. So uh, it's likely we won't be back at it live tomorrow night, but we look forward to uh, following it up next week with a, uh, a comeback show uh, for the, for the live shows on Thursday. But until then, do we do we have a comeback show or uh, don't we have another guest next week or are we not prepared oh, to announce that one yet? It. That's right. Oh no, Pete. three weeks Pete. in a row. Pete, you're all over. No it. live show. 
<laughs> Pete's all over it. That's right. We have uh, Brian Jordan, who is, of course, a, a former Cardinals outfielder, former Atlanta Braves outfielder. He's still with, I believe, still with the uh, Atlanta organization as a broadcaster. Um, and also, well, I don't want to leave this out, as most fans know that that watched him play. He was a two-way player, so he played the Atlanta Falcons early in his career as well. He'll be on with us next week, and so, um, yeah, it might be a couple more weeks until we actually to get to talk to us live again there, uh, Greg and, and CJ. Um, and if you don't, uh, if you don't think that I'm going to ask Brian Jordan, who was the best two-way sports star of the nineties, him, Bo Jackson or prime time, boy, you really don't know me at all. <laughs> no, that's a good question though. I mean, you know, you're, you're, I know where I would default to automatically, but, uh, we'll save it. We'll save it for next week. But until then, uh, we love y'all so much. Bye-bye everyone. Yeah.